distressing to read um, the number of, of children receiving um, food parcels, emergency parcels increased by a third. And I think it's important to put that on record. And I'm sure everyone agrees in here that that is a outrageous situation to, to find ourselves in. Um, as I'm sure all of you will know, I've spoken to many thousands of people over the past few months and the cost of living crisis is absolutely the forefront of people's minds just now. Um, whether we're talking about nearly exactly a year on from the disastrous mini budget, we're talking about Brexit and the spiralling costs of food, fuel, housing costs, people continue to be on this perfect storm. Um, we know that there are measures in place to help families, about the Scottish Government, Scottish Child Payment, for example, and the Joseph Rowntree Foundation had said that, that at the end of last year, that was a, a perfect example of political will being used to boost family budgets here. Um, so on that, I would like to agree with Julia's point here. I think it's really important that we see linkages between the plans being made crystal clear um, when they're, they're coming to various committees, and I welcome David's um, assurances to look at these linkages. Um, and in the same vein, I'd like to praise the, the part of this report about um, the, the work of the CPP in this area in adopting a more integrated, a food, uh, integrated approach to food and prioritising access to emergency food and looking at, at other means in which to do that by boosting budgets directly to people. Um, I would also like to praise the efforts of many local charities and organisations. And I think Councillor Gowland's point here was a really important one, that there's a, a lot of informal work going on that we maybe aren't seeing being reflected in the emergency food uh, packages, um, not least in schools. Um, I know that there's, there's been a, a lot of work um, going on there, which um, I know we've spoken about to some extent before, but it, it would be good to see um, that being brought in when we're, we're looking at this again. Um, and also on the, the point of vouchers, um, at last week I spoke to the community champion of one of the um, large supermarkets in the area um, and they work with food banks um, and she was talking about measures um, that are described here such as offering vouchers um, which is, plays an important role in dignity for people. Um, but also practicality as well, um, with no support for energy bills on the horizon over the winter. Um, it's crucial that people's ability to cook and actually use the food provided is considered, as well as personal taste, dietary requirements um, and so on. And I know that that's been done very sensitively at um, a local level, and I hope that's something that will continue um, as this plan goes forward. Thank you, Chair. Thanks very much for that, um, Councillor Loudon. Um, I would, I would add to that, I, th I think the councillors of all parties will absolutely share your, your concerns. Um, and I think we all know, you know, we all know firsthand uh, how difficult it is for people to, um, to face the cost of living crisis. And when it comes to actually making sure that they can feed their children, there must be very little that's more distressing in life than not knowing where your ability to do that is going to come from. Um, I think there's a huge amount of work that's done by this council um, that shouldn't have to be done, but is done. And I think we're all grateful to officers in every department for uh, for their efforts in that front. And any information that we can gather that will shed a more light and a truer picture of the real situation that we face out there uh, will be very welcome. Uh, and yeah, so thank you for the comments, Katie. Uh, Councillor Thompson. Yeah. Uh, with your indulgence, can I just say two quick points here, or three actually. The Joseph Rowntree Foundation, and as a young married man and with a deaf son, they were invaluable help with me. I really struggling, so a big thanks to them publicly. First time I've ever had the chance to say that. The, the community champion that has the bland time, a local store, they are a great organisation and helped very much in the area. I'd like to thank them as well. But it's Money Matters, my main point. How accessible is Money Matters? If you go, is it easy accessible? I know that some people say to me they're filling uh, forums online, etc. They say the same when dealing with housing rent benefits and that, can we still get one-to-one -one meetings and how accessible are these uh, areas? Can we get, can we meet them quite easily? Thanks, Chair. Thank you very much, Bert. Um, Craig Ferguson is going to come in on that. Yeah, thank you for the question there, Councillor. Um, certainly there's a range of methods that um, clients can use to contact the Money Matters service. Um, obviously, telephone is the one that is most commonly used uh, and through that route, um, clients can actually refer or request uh, for a face-to-face -face meeting and if that is requested then that will be provided um, by the Money Matters advisors. Um, we're also rolling out just online contact methods too. Um, so this allows you know, would-be clients to contact the service out of hours and at times it suits themselves. Uh, and basically what we're seeing now that 
the service providing feedback and contact in response to incoming referral requests, typically within five days of that request coming in. So uh, the service is very mobilised, uh, very proactive in making sure that it's supporting um, households. Thank you. Thanks very much, Craig. Um, I don't see any further requests to speak, so can I ask the committee to agree the report? Thank you very much. Um, moving on to items for noting, uh, to pages 53 through 82 of your packs, it's a good, an update on the Good Food Strategy uh, for quarter four. Um, and I'm going to ask Elaine once again to take us through it. Thank you, Chair. So the purpose of this report is to provide an update on the stages of the Good Food Strategy Action and Measure at Quarter 4 of 2022-2023. Part 3 presents the background of the Good Food Strategy, including the six themes of the strategy, and the action, this action plan uh, was approved last year by this committee. Part 4 provides an overview of progress at Quarter 4, and the full report is available uh, in Appendix 1, and it comes to two parts, so first the performance uh, in contextual measure, and then the second part includes improvement action for each theme of the strategy. So there is a summary of performance measure in Part 4.2. So half of the measure are green, two of them are amber, one is red, and eight of them are contextual. Uh, so the amber measures are related to food growing, so there has been a delay uh, in the delivery of the allotment site in Châtellerault, and therefore the target for a number of food growers and the size of council land made available to food growing could not be achieved. However, the allotment site in Châtellerault is not complete, and amenity services is currently allocating plots to food, to food growers. The red measure uh, also relates to food growing, as the overall number of food growing participants on council land, so this includes school, care, home, housing area, and other, manage, uh, other area managed by groups, could not be estimated uh, this year, and this is due to the partial uh, information shared by food growing participants. Um, then paragraph 4.6, uh, it provides a summary of improvement actions, with four actions which are complete, which were completed, uh, 11 showing a green status, four showing a yellow status, and one of them a red status. So three of the measures showing a number status refer to planning. Uh, two of them will be progress, uh, progress uh, through the preparation of the open space strategy and the delivery of the local, pla uh, local development plan three uh, that will formally start following the approval of the planning committee in August this year. And the third measure refers to the development of local place plans uh, and communities are now encouraged to develop them. Uh, the fourth amber me measure refers to the review of existing services to collect food waste in rural areas and the progress depends on the circular economy bill and the new waste route map. And finally, the red measure refers to the publication of the mid-term review of the good food strategy, and which is currently under development and will be presented to this committee later this year. And in paragraph 4.9, we'll find an overview of key achievements and progress in relation to food at home and the community, including food insecurity, uh, food in the public sector, food economy, food growing, um, food from the environment, and finally around governance. Uh, with regard to employee, employee financial implication and climate change and sustainability implications, so they remain in unchanged compared to the previous food action plans and same thing for the different uh, assessment undertaken when developing the strategy. So I will refer you back to the recommendation paragraph two, which is to ask the committee to note uh, the 2022-2023 pre four position in respect of actions and measures within the good food strategy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elaine. Um, can I ask anyone who would like to comment uh, or ask questions on this item to indicate now? Uh, and first, we're going to go to uh, <laughs> Councillor Clark. Thanks, Chair, and thanks again to Elaine for that detailed report. I guess my question could have gone to either item four or five because they're very closely related, but it's mentioned in item five. There's a note of the appointment of the food champion. And I understand they are an officer, I understand they're agreed, you know, remit, which was agreed by the executive committee. But I would like to ask what, I don't see them mentioned anywhere else in these papers at all. So I'd like to ask what involvement have they had with the good food strategy? Have they actually done anything that's added to what, to added over and above to what we've already been doing? Sorry, yeah, I'm going to go to Elaine. Yeah, so the um, uh, food champion, champion we, uh, received uh, an induction, um, uh, so we went through uh, uh, all the challenges and opportunities of the, of the current food system. Uh, we also discussed the local uh, agenda uh, around food and uh, the national uh, agenda and development uh, uh, on the Good Food Nation. 
um, and the Good Food Ch Champion were also uh, introduced uh, to uh, uh, all officer, officers of services related to food and was also introduced to uh, uh, community uh, organizations. And I think the yeah, this nomination was made public uh, to, um, in South and actual view. Thank you very much for that, Aline. Uh, yeah, Councillor Clark, you want to come back in? Yeah, thanks very much uh, for the answer. And I don't expect to answer the, the rest of these these points, but it, it seems to be most of what they've done already is really an induction. I understand it's the, the first year, but uh, I know we had, our group had these concerns at the time. Uh, so far, it seems to just have been an appointment for for show. Uh, I, I can't find you know, an action in this, which is or a positive action in this, which the the food champion has been responsible for. So ho hopefully, going forward, we can have you know more evidence of involvement. Perhaps you know uh, a, a, you know a report yearly back over detailing you know what they've done over the past year, uh, so we can you. Know, keep up to date and obviously it's important that we're able to other political groups are able to scrutinize that position thank you thanks uh, councillor clark um i've got uh, councillor gowland would like to come in um i'm just I, I will go to you uh, ross and then i might say something myself so councillor gowland hi mark can you hear me yeah we can yeah hi mark yeah so as the as the food champion um as, as Helene said, I've had an induction and I've, I've worked with um, with Helene on, on various different issues. Helene has been on maternity leave for a little while and she's back, not back from not long back from maternity leave. But in terms of the role itself, um, it's about going in, in and speaking to communities about council uh, policy and about how we're actually attacking uh, the, the the crisis in our communities at the moment, and and that's actually links through to to, to climate change and sustainability and. And, uh, and trying to actually un how how things work on the ground as well. So it's not a role which is a, a chair of a committee or anything like that. It's it's more of a working with communities across various different issues. Uh, okay, I mean I'm, I'm looking yeah. forward to working further with Helene actually f further down the line on on various different things that, that we're doing in this committee and out with the committee as well. But I can um, I can fill you in further, Ross, uh, after this committee. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much for that, Ross. Um, before I take anything further than that, I would like to say that I think the food champion role, a bit like the veterans champion role, is one that represents the whole council. And it, I understand that both the councillors, yourself, Ross, and, and the councillor who's the, the veterans champion, do a very good job and are very accessible to councillors of all sides. I would like to think that would continue. And I'm loath to allow this committee or, uh, to maybe unintentionally lead towards something of a, a scrutiny uh, that, you know, that either person or any person in a, a champion role hasn't had, you know, the opportunity to, to prepare for and is not really warranted. So while I take on board the concerns that members may have regarding any role in the council, I think uh, the first protocol, if there is a curiosity as to what any of these roles involve is maybe to speak to the office holder themselves. And I'm very glad, Ross, that you've you've said you are available for, for any councillor who wishes to do that. So um, thank you very much. I, I'm not going to ask you to come back and answer any further questions, frankly, on uh, your day-to-day -day remit. So thank you for that. Councillor Loudon. Um, slightly concerned about the point, um, the, the level of information that was um, received back from community growing organisations. And that was uh, currently sitting at um, a red measure there just in terms of um, what the council have in terms of reporting from them. Um, and I know this is absolutely no slight on them, as uh, Councillor Gowland and myself had both alluded to in the, the last item, the enthusiasm for um growing projects in the, the community is overwhelming. Um, just this week, I learned how to thresh wheat um, that had been grown in various different places around Campus Lang. So I know that good work is out there. I just wonder what we're doing as a council to improve this line of communication so that there is meaningful two-way communication between the council and some of these community projects and what practical steps are we taking to make sure that that measure in particular is improved? Uh, yep, thanks very much, Katie. I'm going to ask David Booth to give you some specifics there. Thanks very much, Chair. Thanks very much, Councillor Loudon. Uh, I suppose what, what I would say is that although that's down in terms of the measurement of the red because of the re return of information from the groups, 
Um, we are working very closely with the, the groups and, and we are just, j just as you've, you've demonstrated yourself through your own engagement with them, um, we are aware that they're doing a great deal of work within the communities and on, on food growing. So it's not that we think that there's a, a that there isn't, the work isn't happening. It's just that this particular measure is based on a, a reliance on them returning some information to us and paperwork in. Uh, as you know, with with many community groups, um, they they're focused on their activities they're doing. Don't not, are maybe not always as quick at coming back with information. We we do have good relationships with them, and we're um, and we'll work with them to make sure that we do get the and are able to record the accurate information that relates to the work that they're doing for our communities. Thank you. Thanks very much, David. Uh, got a final point to be made by Councillor Clark. Thanks, yeah. Apologies uh, for coming again. Just to you know, in response to what you've said previously, uh, I agree with what you've you know most of what you've said about uh, champion roles. Although I do think that there, there needs to be an avenue of public scrutiny of these positions, and uh, councillors who hold positions should be expected to be scrutinised in in public. You know, all of us as politicians should be prepared to uh, receive questions and scrutiny about our various roles. Okay, thank you very much. Um, the comments are certainly noted. Um, I think, to be fair, the, uh, the food champion did come back there with, with uh, some information. Um, so, uh, with that, I'm going to ask committee to agree to note the report. <coughs> thank you very much. Uh, moving on to item six, uh, Sustainable Procurement Duty and Climate Sustainability, pages 83 through 88 of your packs. Uh, Craig Ferguson, could you speak to it? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, so the report provides the committee with an update on the Council's approach to embedding the sustainable procurement duty in contracts with a particular focus on climate sustainability. Uh, in terms of background, the Procurement Reform Act requires councils to consider how they can improve the economic, social and environmental well-being of the authorities' area through the sustainable procurement duty. Uh, worth noting, the duty itself has a scope uh, wider than climate. Uh, the Council report progress on the procurement duty um, through our toolkit and that is reported annually in the procurement annual report. Um, so this report today um, sets out the requirements on the use of the sustainable procurement toolkit, uh, the Scottish Government guidance on climate, um, sustainability and contracts and also provides some case studies that illustrate the approach um, to sustainable procurement and tenders with a particular focus on climate issues. Section four of the report covers the procurement tools that are used. Yeah, there are three overall, yeah, the first one being the, the flexible framework, yeah, this particular one being a self-assessment in its nature. And you'll see at 4.2 there, yeah, the current scoring that applies to, to the five categories. The prioritisation tool itself, that supports early strategic planning and that ensures very much a structured approach to the assessment of procurement categories. Um, and the outcome from that analysis uh, we've done already on this, uh, detailed below 4.6 uh, in, in the bar chart presented. Um, we've then got the last tool, which is the sustainability test. Uh, and this ensures that sustainability requirements are embedded at a contract or framework level. Then just lastly in this section, at 4.9, we're just referencing the current priorities here around ensuring continued progress in the duty, uh, including developing new guidance um, for climate-specific technical scoring and training, those involved in relevant procurements and also aim to go live with new community benefits software uh, by March next year. Um, section 5 covers sustainability and contracts. It notes a range of areas through which we can embed sustainability uh, within tender documentation. Um, the one there I draw to attention is in the technical envelope itself. And this is where we get, we get greatest discretion here, and in particular technical questions around sustainability which then weighted and then scored as part of the overall tender evaluation. Then perhaps on working at a practical level, we can also apply minimum order and delivery levels. Um, basically a useful mechanism to ensure that, you know, we're not getting too many regular orders of small value items and uh, making sure that we're maximising the delivery mechanisms there, to obviously reduce transportation costs and also reduce the climate impact as well. Um, the Council's approach to sustainability weighting contracts has been increased um, from 20 to 30 percent this year, and that's in respect to the technical envelope, yeah, and also introduces a particular score for climate sustainability for the first time. Um, that weighting itself can be varied between fair work first, climate, and community benefits, 
And that weighting very much depends upon the nature of the works, goods or services that are being procured. Um, so this new weighting for sustainability can be particularly to each tender, um, but can generally ask bidders to demonstrate how they'll ensure the contract will deliver in an environmentally sustainable way. A particular focus on mitigating carbon emissions, and there's some examples here provided at 5.3. <coughs> Section 6 outlines the Scottish Government guidance in this area. Uh, the most recent policy note published in June 22. And uh, this SPPN encourages council to focus on you know, essentially whether to buy, what to buy, how to buy, and also how much. Um, and these principles are very much adopted um, by the test we use uh, that comprises one of the sustainable procurement tools. And the council procurement network is very much focused on demand management principles in respect of procurement of goods, so we can buy less and to buy at all and also looking to extend the useful life where possible. Uh, and some recent examples there is 6.3, including the removal of sticky notes from stationary catalogues, uh, reducing the thickness of laminate within schools, and also extend the useful life of dust sheets used by property services. Section 7 provides three case studies um, that hopefully can kind of bring to life just some of this kind of working in practice. Uh, you'll see the first one there uh, references a household waste recycling centre, that tender was published in July 23, and we used the, the, the toolkit sustainability test to ensure the standards there were embedded in the specification and also within the technical envelope. Um, the second case study is centres on the passenger transport framework. Um, climate sustainability within the technical envelope there was weighted at 10%. Um, and then just the last one there is in relation to a property services project um, on a construction refit. Um, and the refit of 26 properties in the Hamilton area <coughs> included the new roof coatings, replacement of UPVC fascias and soffits, um, and the works were carried out to the off-gen uh, accessible specification 2035, and that contained multiple innovative uh, energy improvement measures um, carried out in a whole house approach um, to, to retrofit. And if I can refer members back to, to the recommendations and ask the contents of the report noted. Thank you, Chair. Thanks very much for that, Craig. Can I ask any members uh, to indicate if they'd like to comment? Councillor Rob. Thank you. Uh, and thanks very much, Craig, for all the work you've done. Um, it's clearly progress as well. You can see in 4.2 that the council scores two um, out of five in terms of the progress, but I think it is a work in progress and hopefully um, as things move on in future years, we'll see that creep up to three or four or even five in future years. So th thanks for that work. Um, my question is around how services in terms of whether to buy, how can they find out if there's another service that has an item that they could use? I understand there's some internal system um, that shows what another service might be disposing of that another service could may maybe use, or even if communities, if it's checked against the community wish list, if they could use some of that, closing that kind of waste loop. So um, a bit more information on that would be great. Thanks. Uh, Craig. Yeah, thank you, Councillor Rob. Um, just on the first point you've made there in relation to the performance levels for the flexible framework, uh, I can advise we're currently working towards achieving level three um, for people process and also uh, monitoring and reporting, uh, and we expect to achieve level three by the end of, of this financial year. Um, in terms of your, your point there around um, resources, you know, effectively um, offering up assets that are no longer of use. Um, probably the most practical example I can give is in relation to, to office furniture, uh, where quite often that is reused multiple times. Uh, certain services, spaces no longer required, then that surplus furniture is essentially um, offered up um, to, to other, other resources. But that's obviously a continual process look to refine to try and secure further improvements in that area. Thanks very much for that, Craig. Um, I don't have any further requests to comment, so can I ask committee to agree to note the report? Thank you very much. Um, item seven, uh, food procurement, findings of the market capacity assessment and next steps, uh, directed to pages 89 through 104 of your packs. And I once again invite Elaine Gourish on to speak to it. Thank you, Chair. So the purpose of this report is to present the findings and recommendations from the market capacity assessment on food procurement, as well as, as, well as the next steps as described in the action plan. Paragraph 3 presents the background behind the analysis, 
and power four, you'll find the objective of the analysis and an overview of the activity undertaken for this analysis is available in paragraph five. Then paragraph six, there is a summary of the finding with an overview of console buyers in paragraph 6.1, then an overview of the food purchased by the console in paragraph 6.2. So it includes a table showing the different contracts, the value, and there is information on the share of food product which is currently com coming from Scotland, and information about current sub supplier base in Lanarkshire. In paragraph 6.3, uh, there is an overview of the food and drink market uh, in Lanarkshire, indicating that only 22 local food and drink businesses engage with the consultant which is a low number compared to the number of food and drink businesses in the area. It also shows that there is a thriving artisan food scene and that actual production essentially focuses on livestock with little crops being produced. Paragraph 6.4 show practices in relation to procurement implemented in two other council. Uh, they were selected because they are perceived as well advanced in terms of local food, uh, local food procurement, but their requirements in terms of volume uh, are much lower compared to South Lanarkshire. So the key learning from these two examples uh, is that they split the loss for local producer to be, able to be able to supply only one area or only one product. Then key findings are available in paragraph 6.5. So as mentioned earlier, engagement with supplier has been challenging uh, with a low level of response from businesses. So either due to difficult context for businesses under pressure with limited time to engage with third parties and or low interest from businesses. The main challenges that businesses and the council would face are that several local products don't match the demand of all council buyers, and this is particularly true for facilities, given the specific requirements they have. None of the business can fulfill the scale of the current requirement for schools, but some businesses could supply one element of the requirement. And finally, acquisition all by businesses are very variable depending on businesses and might not match the council requirement. Another key finding is that there is already a certain level of food currently sourced from, biz uh, from businesses based in Lanarkshire, in particular milk and meat. And current suppliers of the council follow a strategy to expand local procurement by trying to increase the number of local uh, food supplier, sub food sub supplier. Then uh, the key challenges and opportunities are presented in part 6.6. Uh, and so if suitable products and businesses were identified, the strategy of pleating lots uh, during the tendering process could potentially be adopted, but this approach is likely to imply more resources from procurement, procurement services, facility services, and environmental services. To meet the console demand in terms of volume, opportunities of collaboration among businesses could be explored. To overcome the issue of accreditation, business support provided by the console and partners could be targeted to specific businesses. Um, challenges perceived among suppliers also include the lack of capacity of businesses to engage with the public sector. However, support is available through the supplier development program to do this. In the short term, there are more opportunities to make progress at uh, SLLC venues, and this is due to the type of produce and volume used in these venues. And uh, another finding is, uh, is that, as illustrated in the table uh, in paragraph 6.2, uh, Subcontract opportunities are significant uh, with the possibility for local small scale providers to supply food uh, to the larger suppliers such as Brex, Muller, or Campbell Meat. In paragraph 7, there is an evaluation of the market capacity ass assessment exercise. And uh, after you have paragraph 8, which describes the next steps with a list of actions to be undertaken by economic development facilities and SLC. So two of them uh, aim to continue engagement with the 22 businesses identified, including for SLLC, we wish to use the quick quote process to increase supply of local food in Chatelroom. One action is about uh, identifying other good practices in other local authorities which are comparable to, uh, to the council in terms of volume. And then three actions are on business support, so including <coughs> funding to the accelerator program <coughs> It's a Sanacture, support the food and drink business network Lanarkshire Ladder, and support local businesses in accessing uh, subcontracting opportunities. In terms of monitoring, as described in Path 8.2, so updates will be provided twice a year as part of the quarter two and quarter four reports of the food action plan presented uh, to this committee. So there is no direct financial implication as a result of the recommendations. And the main, main risk identifies the possibility for the council to have difficulties to progress the objective of increasing the provision of local food. So I will refer you back uh, to the recommendation in paragraph two, which is to note the finding and recommendation from the market capacity assessment and food procurement, as well as the next steps as described in the action plan. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elaine. Um, Councillor Clark. Thanks, Chair, and thanks again to Elaine for that very detailed report. 
Uh, my question really on page 95 at 7.1, it says, uh, while assessment of current interest and capacity has been undertaken, no assessment of required development to meet the council's demand has been undertaken. Is uh, something we, we plan to do? understand obviously the next section includes next steps and monitoring, which is really important. So do we expect, you know, how much of the, the gap will this, you know, bridge the gap being, you know, these businesses' capacity and the council's, you know, demand? Uh, yeah, thanks. Do you want to come back in, Elaine? Yeah. yeah um, so maybe the first thing maybe is to is to note that there is uh, there is limited opportunity uh, for especially for facility services to source local food uh, at at the moment with the current market. However, we'll we'll uh, con so it's part of the next of the action uh, uh, for this year. So we'll continue to engage with these businesses, um, with these twenty two businesses, to understand uh, how we, we the council could, could work uh, to. To work with them, and we also will also look at uh, what's happening in in other local authorities, so mainly uh, Glasgow City Council, to to understand their, their practices. Thank you very much, Councillor Ross. That's it. It's gone green. <laughs> gone green. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I couldn't see it from my angle. <laughs> I was sitting there. Uh, uh, thanks for the report, Elaine. Uh, I was very interested. Uh, in the, the, the part uh, where we talked about uh, East Ayrshire Council. Uh, I had the privilege to visit them a couple of years ago uh, and noted the advancements they had in bringing forward local projects. Uh, they started from a very small uh, situation where they helped some local suppliers get up to the position where they could supply effectively the council <coughs> and its requirements. Uh, and I think we possibly need to look at uh, our involvement and how we help uh, some small local suppliers get to that level where they're able to produce the goods that we need as a council. So, yeah, uh, I think it's a very good report and I think there's a lot there we can take from it going forward. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, John. Um, David Beth would like to come in on that. David. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you very much, Councillor Ross. Uh, yeah, um, uh, Helene and the team have been engaging with other local authorities in terms of some of the success stories that they've had in the past, and, and, including uh, the authority you referred to. The, um, the, the, the challenges in South Lanarkshire are, 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 are slightly different, I think, than some of the smaller authorities in terms of just the, the volume, uh, if, if I take Kevin's, facilities management and schools and feeding schools with a number of schools and the the, the amount of uh, security we require for in terms of uh, that that constant supply there are opportunities in other areas of the business where there's more flexibility and again some of the the venues that are operated in the council's behalf for south lanch leisure and culture for example short chatler uh, where uh, in the cafes where we can have a, a bit more of a, a focus on on building up that that, that supply chain uh, with local uh, businesses and, and we're doing some really good work on that basis and um, we're also through the, the the good work of the supplier development program and through uh, events such as meet the buyer events that the council will run for uh, our, our enterprise and sustainability uh, resource um, we, we, we are trying to develop that, that line. So, so that we are making some good progress in that area. Some of the challenges in terms of the scale and the volume and the uh, the, the, the secure supply that we require um, are, are, are more difficult to overcome. I'd also maybe point out as well uh, where we do have a uh, we, we do use big suppliers, you, you know, breaks and things like that. Um, a lot of, we, we believe a lot of that that uh, food is coming from a local source, but it's just coming through that supplier, and we're trying to identify the amount of local food that we're getting through that route as well. Thanks. Thanks very much, David. I'm going to take a final question, this item from Councillor Allison. Alec? It's been covered, but I lost my Conferro, my Conferro connection there. Um, first thing to say is it's pleasing to see that 100% of milk is Scottish, and even more pleasing to see that of the 99% of the fresh meat, most of it comes from Ward 3, so it's obviously very high quality you're buying. Um, but it does... It does disappoint me, well, 
or maybe not even sur surprise me or disappoint me. Fresh fruit and veg, only 16% is Scottish spent, and that happens to be because it's bought in the Glasgow fruit market. Where does it come from? It's very unlikely to be Scottish, and I think it's things like that that we are going to need to look at uh, going forward if we're wanting to be more local. If you need to get more businesses involved, I think then we need to, as I think it says in the report, look at the barriers that they are finding. They're not finding it worthwhile to go through the bureaucracy and change their business model to be able to supply into the likes of the council. Finally, how much of being part of Excel is a negative in terms of what we're trying to do here? Because um, they are focused, I have the page up in front of me, they're not focused on local product, they are focused I own, on best value, I think, which I'm not disagreeing with, but I think that needs that focus needs to change if we are wanting to change some of these pic, uh, figures. And a little bit tongue-in-cheek, what is the carbon footprint of having to import all that um, majority of our food? <laughs> uh, thanks very much, Alec. Um, I'm not sure how much of that can be answered, but I'll see if David would uh, like to have a stab at it. Thanks very much, Chair. Thanks very much, Councillor Allison. And, and, and all the points you've, you've made there, I think, are, are all relevant uh, points. It is... Um, if you take fruit, fruit and veg, um, part, part of the challenge ahead is is to try and and, and create that, that 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 link between um, suppliers and and the council. Um, you all appreciate that the in terms of the the food that we put, particularly in children's plates, it's got a it's we we need the assurance in terms of the um, that they, they they can get that assurity of supply and and they can reach. Uh, an element of of quality, um, and I, I'm not saying for a second that, that our local suppliers can do that, but they, it needs to be uh, demonstrable as well. And and we also have to uh, make sure that, uh, bring up your point in best value, that we um, that we can demonstrate a uh, best value. Um, we are we are locked into to, to contracts through uh, Excel and, and others um, that we. And, and again, we work on that because there is a big push, as you know, with the council to try where possible to bring uh, local supply chains in, a, a force, not just in terms of food, but um, across uh, any of the activities that the, the council makes. So we'll continue uh, to work on that. It's, it's not without its challenge, um, but as you can see from the report, um, we're making good progress across a lot of areas there. We're trying to develop um, the market uh, and we're trying to kind of through things like the Meet the Bailer events, through the Supplier Development Programme, we're trying to make the, the process for local supply chains to access council services for food and for other services as, as easy as possible and help them prepare uh, and get them to that standard that is inevitably required before they can trade with the council. Thank you. Thanks very much, David. Um, Kevin would like to come in. So, Kevin Carr. Thanks, Chair. Um, your point's well made, Councillor Allison. Um, I mean, Scotland Excel was set up all those years ago for the benefit of scale and economies of scale and saving councils money. <clears throat> and the direction of travel over the last 10 years has been about more local spend. And to be fair to Scotland Excel, they're starting to pay more attention to that and focus on it. Um, for us, as a large local authority, one of our biggest challenges in that is logistics. And the same way, <coughs> excuse me, our subcontractors and as the report sets out, I think one of the quick wins could be around working with our local suppliers to work with the big wholesalers around fruit and veg or the likes of breaks to supply them and they provide the logistical um, relationship that then we can engage with. And again, as, as David's outlined, that's some of the next steps for this, you know, this process in terms of the market assessment. Thank you very much for that. Um, yeah, I, th I think just to reiterate that everything that can be done should be done to encourage small businesses and local businesses to, to step forward and access these contracts. But I think councillors have to remember as well that the, it is very important that we have security of supply there because uh, we all know the difficulties we've experienced with regards to contractors for buses uh, for schools um, pulling out at very short notice and the, the chaos that has caused. So I would uh, ask... Uh, 
I'd ask elected members uh, to, to bear that in mind when we are considering um, how easy it is necessarily to do these things. Um, with that said, um, move it, I'll ask the committee to agree to note the report. Thank you very much. Moving on to item eight, uh, quarter four progress report for the previous financial year, sustainable development and climate change strategy action plan. And you'll find it on pages 105 through 144. I'd like to invite Catherine McCafferty to speak to us. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, the purpose of this report is to provide an update on the Sustainable Development and Climate Change Strategy Action Plan for 22-23 at quarter four. Section three provides a background in the strategy and action plan. The new Sustainable S Development and Climate Change Strategy for 22-27 was approved by South Lanarkshire Council on the 15th of June 2022. It was agreed that the action plan for 22-23 would be an interim, interim action plan which this quarter four report closes off and is the final report against the 2017 to 2022 strategy. The action plan is reported using IMPROVE and a full copy of the report can be found in Appendix 1. At the beginning of the IMPROVE report, you will find the strategies diagram outlining the three themes of sustainable council, sustainable environment and sustainable communities and the strategic outcomes. The report then provides the quantitative measures, both performance and contextual. The performance measures highlight progress towards each of these outcomes. The contextual measures are not within the full scope of the Council, however, they do provide a health check for this area. The next part of the improved report provides progress on the 2022-23 improvement actions towards each outcome. Returning to the covering report, section 4.2 provides a summary of the progress on the quantitative measures. Two red measures have been reported in quarter four, and paragraph 4.3 provides an explanation for the slippage. Paragraph 4.4 summarises progress on the improvement actions. The majority were completed or still on schedule. These improvement actions that have a green status are ongoing and will continue to be actioned as part of our new strategy. There are nine AMBER actions. The justifications for these delays and associated management actions are included in Appendix 1. Paragraph 4.6 of the report provides an overview of some of the highlights of 22-23, including 16 new local nature reserves. Uh, sites have been developed, and that's been bringing together Scottish Government Nature Reserve Funding and Climate Emergency Fund. Two temporary waste service assistants have been recruited to facilitate projects aimed at reducing residual waste and increasing recycling rates. The Climate Emergency Community Grant Scheme has been very successful, with 34 groups receiving funding during 22-23. The Food Strategy Community Grants have also been extremely popular, with almost £2,000 of funding allocated in year one, rather than over the two years as was originally planned. And the Conference of Schools Climate Conference was successfully held by education in the Palace Grounds in October 2022, and this was very successful with a high level of participation. So if I can refer you back to section two of the covering report, the committee is asked to note the progress made at quarter four in respect of the actions <coughs> and measures within the Sustainable Development and Climate Change Strategy Action Plan for 22-23. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Catherine. Can I ask any uh, councillor who would like to comment on this item to indicate their desire to do so now? Uh, first, I'm going to come to Councillor Clark. Thanks again, Mark, and thank you for that report. I've got two questions, but I'll ask them both just now, and I can come back on them if, if needed. On page 130, it said the majority of work is uh, complete with the ash die or the ash die back action plan. Uh, when should we expect that to be, or the final action plan to be completed? Uh, and then my second question relates to. Page 143 mentions the Climate Schools Conference, uh, and I would agree it was a very successful conference. I was glad to have attended it myself. Uh, but now that it's a year on, do we have any further you know, update on the, the progress of the schools since then with, their, uh, with the pledge or any other actions that they've, they've taken? And do they plan to hold a second one? Thanks very much. I'm going to go to Kevin Carr first and then I think Catherine might want to come in as well. So, Kevin. Thanks, Chair. If I can take the Ash Dieback question. So, members will be aware we got some additional funding this year in the capital programme and that's allowed us to bring in staff assessors. So, two more assessors, they're now working through um, our ash trees at the moment and what that's doing is it's increasing the data set in terms of 
us getting a better picture of what the challenge really is that the council's facing. So they're working through that programme of work just now. I would expect into 2024, um, our data set will be up to a point where we're confident enough to come back to council to say, this is the challenges we're facing. Here's an action plan that will help us take us some way forward to addressing that. Um, however, the elephant in the room will be the funding around all of that. Um, I think it's no secret that it's a huge liability that all councils are facing in Scotland at the moment. Um, the last figure I've seen at a national level is potentially half a billion just for Scotland. Um, so by next year, we'll have a better idea, I think, once we've got through that second phase of work over this growing season, and we'll bring our paper at some point in early 2024. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that. Catherine, would you like to come in too? Um, yeah, I've got a little update from education. Um, now, they've said that as a result of the Conference of Schools, um, they've got an increased amount of primary schools participating in the Keep Scotland Beautiful Eco Schools Awards, and they're looking to attain green flag status for a few schools. Um, and the Youth Forum is also taking steps to plan a second Conference of Schools. Um, it's due... I'm saying here scheduled for February 2023, but I think probably February 2024. Um, and that's going to promote climate, climate awareness and sustainability among our secondary schools. Um, and there's also a few food waste programmes going on. Um, a pilot waste pro project with um, Lark Hall Academy and Trini Trinity High. And they're also launching a sustainability and climate change app through a few schools as well. So there's a lot of work going on in the uh, secondary schools as well. Thanks very much for that. Um, Councillor Rob. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, a couple of uh, wee questions on this. Um, maybe just a wee follow up on um, Ross's question there. Uh, the action and the strategies for young people to shape and influence outcomes in the Council's sustainable development strategy. So I'm just, I know schools can do things on their own and young people, but I'm just wondering what, what, how has that happened? How have young people? shaped and influenced outcomes in the Council's sustainability strategy. Sorry, Catherine, giving you a question in your, your first one. Um, I've got another couple, but I'll maybe just do them one at a time. Um, I think, well, as you're aware, the, um, the Youth Forum did present at a um, previous um, committee, um, and I think they're looking to do that again in the near future. Um, and obviously, they'll get their sort of points of view across in front of all the sort of management and councillors, and that obviously helps influence our future decisions. Um, Speaking to the youth and speaking to the um, the youth forum was, I think everyone agreed they did an um, excellent presentation previously. Uh, yeah, David Beth would like to come in as well. Thanks very much. I, I suppose just just to supplement that that, that point as well, the, uh, the, there's an internal uh, officer group in terms of sustainable development um, that that is. It, it, it pulls all this information together. That's a, that's a, a, a group right across the council with every resource in the council represented, including the education resources. Um, and within that that group, in terms of representation from education resources, there's always also linking in um, to the youth forum. So there is a there is already a line of communication between young people uh, and the development of the strategies and information that comes forward for elected members to consider. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, Kirsten, do you have other ones to... Um, it would be great to hear a bit more about that, if that was possible, a future meeting. That would be good. Um, a couple other questions. Page Top of page 117, um, I know the progress was made in reductions, partly due to um, COVID, but also um, the decarbonisation of the grid and so on. Um, I know there was no reduction target for 2023 24 so my question is um, around with the ether work being done and the other different things that are happening strategy-wise with buildings and so on, when do you think we'll be in a position for the council to set a path to net zero for, for its own buildings and so on by 2038? Yeah, um, David would like to come in on that one. Um, so so uh, uh, um, uh, that's one maybe for our colleagues from House and Technical Resources. I'd need to take that one away, Councillor, if that's okay. We'll come back with an answer. Thank you. Okay. Sure. Just uh, yeah, doing my last one. Yeah, if you've got one more. <laughs> uh, okay, last one. Um, and uh, about the biodiversity strategy, I know there's been a bit of a delay to that. Um, we haven't had a report on biodiversity since 2021, I believe. Um, and I think the next biodiversity implementation report is due by, to government by the end of December. So it was just to catch up if that will be presented to the next climate committee for sign off. Uh, Kevin Carr. Sorry. 
Thanks, Chair. Um, yes, so that will be presented to November Committee. Uh, that committee will also bring probably, I think it's our first update on pollinators and biodiversity and an update in the Nature Restoration Fund and the work we've been doing around that over the last two years. And the biodiversity strategy will then be presented in February next year. Thank you very much. Um, we've got three more uh, questions in this item, so I'll, I'll take those and then I think we'll move on. So first up, Alec Allison. It is. Uh, one is the percentage of council stock meeting the SHQS standard. My understanding was that the fixed electrical testing systems had to be in place by February this year. So is there any um, legal implications for failing to meet that target or not target for that requirement? And where's my thing? secondly, the percentage of total household waste that is recycled. You've highlighted the work you're doing for the uh, flat, for the flatted accommodation and the problems you have there. But I think there is roughly I think it's 5,000 houses in the rural area do not have a burgundy bin. What action has been taken to rectify that and give them the same level of service as the rest of the council area? Yeah, uh, David. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. The, uh, just in terms of the um, SHQS a, a comment, um, I, I would need to check in terms of the legal position on that, um, but the, I do know that recent changes to the um, to the uh, the standard uh, um, has meant that we're, our colleagues from Housing and Technical Resources are having to uh, recast and reshape the amount of work that they're doing that, and they're trying to accelerate some of that work as well um, to ensure that we've got appropriate um, programmes in place as early as possible. In terms of the legal point, I, I would need to take that one away and, and, and come back about where that sits us, because again, that would just sit um, with colleagues from uh, Housing and Technical Resources. I think maybe, Kevin, do I pass on to you? Is that okay for the second point? Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Chair. Um, Councillor Allison, as, as you're aware, you know, the Council used the delegation and the, the food waste regulations that came in a number of years ago where councillors, uh, councils are allowed exemptions due to financial or environmental reasons. Um, and that was why the 5,000 households, rural households in Clydesdale were exempted from that. Um, in one of the previous papers, it refers to the circular economy bill that's going through Parliament at the moment. Um, there's been a recent call for evidence on that. Um, what's been consulted on is potentially um, the new legislation, including the, removing that derogation um, and local authorities then rolling out full recycling services to all properties in their local area. Um, now that's just been consulted at the moment. Um, again, a lot of the feedback that local authorities and Causal and Solace have made at this point is, yeah, you know, it's a, it's a great ambition. However, it would there's significant financial implications on that. And if local authorities are to deliver it, then they would need to see significant financial increase in, in our current budgets to do so. Thanks very much for that. Uh, Alec, would you like to come back in? or are you? Um, just really to make the point, I think it's wrong to provide service on a geographic basis. Um, yeah. It shouldn't matter where you are. You should Services should be generic and not limited just to the urban areas. All right. Okay, thank you very much for the comments. Uh, Councillor Clark. Thanks again, Chair. Just to come back on Councillor Rob's question and the answers from uh, officers, more of a, a comment than a question. Uh, it is important to, to highlight the, the importance of the continued engagement with the youth forum and young people. Uh, I know this isn't, hap this isn't happening here with, with our officers, but one of the, the, the concerns young people often have with engagement is that they're consulted on and then a year later... You know, they haven't heard anything between that. They're kind of consulted on year by year and there's not that continued engagement. So I know this is happening, but it's important to highlight the importance of that continued engagement and to be able to show that their concerns or their asks have been actioned upon. So you've asked for this, we have done this, or we can do this because, and be able to, you know, evidence that, that engagement. Uh, again, more of a comment and a, a question, but I think it's still important to highlight. 
Yeah. Um, thank you very much for that. Um, I, I think, yes, we, we all agree with that and I'm glad you've highlighted it. Thank you. Um, Councillor Lockhart. Um, just one point. Uh, there seems to be a, a, quite a lot of focus, obviously, in um, replacing other forms of heating, oil, gas, LPG and all the rest of it, uh, with air source heat pumps. And as this seems to be a major part, of, if you like, our drive towards climate change, I would have thought it should form part of this report that we see some sort of update in progress in this area, if you like, in terms of fitting to council buildings and also to other council-owned properties. I mean, this is a big black hole where there is absolutely no information, and I would have thought there should be. Um, yeah, David Beth. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you very much, and thank you uh, very much, Councillor Lockhart, for your question. Um, this report is is is, is covering is, is just a summarising all the different activity uh, within the council. Where, where um, colleagues from House and Technical Resources are working on a number of reports, and um, particularly around about uh, the challenges around uh, you know us getting to net zero in terms of our building stock. Um, in both in terms of the the, 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 the the council's building stock and in terms of the um, the overall challenges that, that South Lanarkshire itself uh, faces as it moves forward. So so we are expecting to bring forward to this committee through colleagues in housing and technical resources uh, more detailed information um, that will cover the use of uh, various technologies uh, and uh, uh, fuel sources for, for buildings as, as the future. So uh, it's not so much in this report because this is just covering the kind of more you know, all, all of the information, but there are more specialist reports coming forward in due course. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, David. I've got two more requests to speak. I'm going to go to Julia Mars and then Ralph Barker. Uh, so, Councillor Mars. Just on um, Councillor Alison's point regarding burgundy bins, I realised that that when um, SNP held the administration, we did have a budget line, which was agreed at the time, to provide hot composters to people in the rural area, understanding the difficulty um, that they do not have the same service as, as people in more urban areas. As I understand it, priorities were changed by the current administration and that, that hot composter scheme is no longer available. Um, I wonder if um, any further clarity on the status of that um, project or any other alternative that to maybe be considered can be offered to this committee. Uh, Kevin Carr. Thanks, Chair. Just, just to confirm, yes, the, the, the funding was reallocated for other priorities. Um, at the time, we had purchased 50 hot composters. And I think we mentioned that the last committee were, were happy um, to give them out to residents as they require, but it is only 50 as opposed to the 5,000 that we did. Um, initially scoped within the review. Um, at this point, there's no other plans to roll out a similar um, service within the Clydesdale area. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the Circular Economy Bill is now including some consultation and potentially including those in future changes to the legislation. And I think we'll just await that to the end of that consultation process. Thank you very much, Kevin, and thank you for the question, Julia. Uh, Councillor Barker. Thanks again for you know, the amount of work that's gone into these reports. Um, I just want to uh, support Councillor Allison with his mention of Burgundy Bins. Um, I appreciate the pros and cons, both financial and environmental, of where we are at the moment. I would just like to add that for the rural area, there's the, the added imposition, including in, environmental imposition, of the greater distance to the recycling centre for uh, constituents uh, taking garden waste, etc., uh, to the nearest uh, recycling centre. Um, so it's a bit of an imposition, the long distances, and I'm sure that there could be a, um, a better, lower emissions if we had uh, a different system one way, one way or another. Um, so thanks for that. Any comment on that? Uh, I do have to say on the hot composters, I really didn't find any enthusiasm for them amongst constituents. Um, they did tend to say they wanted the same service 
um, that was given to the more urban areas. Right, thank you, Chair. Thank you very much for that, um, Ralph. Um, Councillor, oh, I did say I wasn't going to take in further, but Councillor Mars has indicated she'd like to come back in. So uh, apologies, Julie, I didn't ask you if you wanted the supplementary, so I'll come back to you now. Um, it was more in response to, to Councillor Barker's comment because I find the complete opposite. I find constituents very keen to ha have a hot compost or actually um, believing in their very rural circumstances to, for that to be a very sustainable um, situation for them. Um, so I think I, it is very sad that the what was agreed um, two years ago um, actually has not come to pass. And I think that the fact that is 50... Um, or as I understand it, it might even be as low as 30 um, hot composters available. Um, given it, what is the publicity for that? Because you, it would seem odd to publicise something that we can only provide to 30 or 50 constituents. In fact, that would probably cause a greater problem than than solve. So, so what what is the the way that people can access um, those 50 hot composters? Okay, thank you, Julia. Kevin Carr would like to come in on that. Thanks, Councillor Mars. No, you're right, we, we didn't do any publicity around the 50 for the, the very reason that you stated. We were worried in case we generated much more interest than actually we were able to fulfil. So there hasn't been any publicity around it now, but if you are aware of any residents who would like access to one of the 50, we're happy to take requests for that. Thank you very much. Um, with that, uh, we've got no further questions. I'll ask the committee to agree to note the report. Thank you very much. Our final item today, uh, pages 145 through 160 of your pack. Uh, I'm going to invite Emma Berry to speak to the litter strategy. Um, so over to you, Emma. Thank you, Chair. Uh, the purpose of the report is to provide an update of um, the work undertaken today on the litter strategy 2022 to 2027 and the associated action plan. So in section two, the committee is asked to approve the following recommendations. The progress and the updates of the litter strategy action plan be noted and the pilot projects updates be noted. So the litter strategy covers the period 2022 to 2027 and was approved by the Climate Change and Sustainability Committee on the 31st of August 2022. The strategy outlines a clear vision for how the Council will develop visions, plans and initiatives to prevent and address litter, dog fouling and fly tapping. Over the past year, there has been positive engagement with a diverse a range of community groups and individuals through the community cleanup web form of supporting groups and residents in conducting litter picks and cleanups. We've also actively engaged with the uh, Climate Change and Sustainability Youth Forum. There's also been positively more on this subject in the national media with the National Litter and Flight Up and Strategy been, pub um, been published in June and also the Circular Economy Bill going through Parliament at the moment. Uh, the purpose of the Litter Strategy Steering Group that was set up was to provide leadership, governance and an oversight that will drive collaborative action across the whole of the Council to achieve the vision and objectives outlined in the Litter Strategy. Um, the group has been invaluable in discussing current practices and encouraging innovative cooperative collaboration across all of the Council resources. It's highlighted areas for future development, innovative pilot projects and created the Litter Strategy Action Plan. That is included within Appendix 1 and it's also got updates against each of the actions. <laughs> within 4.5 of the report, there's also some highlights provided from the year. Um, at Section 5, uh, it covers baseline data to support the delivery of the strategy and help measure success. The steering group has set out a suite of baseline data that will be monitored over the life of the strategy, this information is presented in Appendix 2 and there's also a summary on Section 5 within the report. Um, in Section 6, we cover the pilot initiatives. So as part of the implementation of the strategy, the steering group agreed to establish three pilot projects that would cover um, or that would require collaborative working to target areas of concern. These pilot projects are town centres, uh, Campus Lang Main Street, housing and industrial estates. I would now like to refer you back to the recommendation in 2.1 and ask the committee 
that the progress and updates of the letter strategy action plan be noted and the pilot projects updates also be noted. Thanks very much for that, Emma. Um, I'm going to invite uh, any councillors who wishes to comment or ask a question to indicate that they want to do so now. Um, first up, we're going to go to Councillor Gowland. Ross? Thanks, Chair. Um, thanks for the accurate report from the officer. An ongoing issue we have in the council is litter left by companies like Amy, who do work on our motorways, and uh, the workers employed by Amy leave a huge amount of litter. Um, and have a black spot in my ward on the slip road off the M74, where a huge amount of rubbish has been left uh, quite recently after some work was done. Um, can I ask officers how we can leverage our relationship with Amy so they can do the jobs properly and, and make, make sure that no rubbish is left after after work is done, things like road works? Because as a, as a, a ward councillor, I do find Amy uh, notoriously difficult to get in contact with and for them to action things. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much, Ross. Uh, Colin Park. Thanks, Chair. And uh, Councillor Lambe, if you want to, sorry, Councillor Gowland, if you want to kind of get in touch with me afterwards, I'll link you up with colleagues at Amy and I'll also kind of pick that up for you as well. Thank you. Thanks very much for that. Um, Councillor Mars. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. I can still see Ross. I'm presuming. Oh. Yeah, that, we can, that yeah. you now? Perfect. Yeah, you um, thank you, Chair. Um, yes, I very much um, welcome the community um, clean, clean up support noted on page 147 in 5.1. Um, very much welcome the, uh, the bag uplifts and the high vis jackets, the pickers and equipment that, that is um, provided to, uh, to community groups, right down to, as I say, very, very local support when ad hoc vehicles have been known to stop and help community groups with heavy bags rather than moving them to the, the nearest uh, litter bin for, for later pickup. So I think between um, the uh, strategy and the low, very local support, um, I'm, I'm very much welcome that. Um, I would also seek circa cl cir further clarity, though, in terms of the wider support um, for those activities in terms of additional litter bins, um, signage to discourage litter drop. Um, and if we don't have one available, um, as I understand it, we don't, I think that a toolkit would be useful to um, for the, the range of support that can be given to local groups who are working so hard to keep our, our local area um, very clean and tidy. Thank you for that, Julia. Uh, Kevin Carr would like to come in and respond. Thanks, Councillor Mars. I think it's a great point. Um, the first year of litter strategy implementation has been very much focused internally and in getting services around the table regularly, probably for the first time, um, and we're working much more closely together. The second year is very much going to be focused on supporting our community more because a lot of the work that's going kind of unsung, I think, at the moment is invaluable to us. And we're very aware even that the data that we've included in here is probably undercooking it. I think there's much more going on. Um, as part of that process, the group started to look at best practice arrangements in other councils, um, including some of the toolkits that they're using to better support um, community groups. And that, as I said, that's very much going to be our focus on, on the second year. Thanks very much for that, Kevin. Um, we've got two further questions. Uh, I'm going to go to Alec Allison first. And I'll take a third actually as well. But Alec, then Ralph Barker, then John Ross. So, yeah. Alec. Sorry, cheers, Chair. Yeah, just uh, like to highlight the fact that um, the Water Councils do mainly in high streets, but in the urban areas for trying to make our towns keep keep them right. We also have to identify, as Julia was talking about, was the volunteer groups that look at the entrances basically to our towns and villages throughout Clydesdale. They're out two or three times a year minimum tidying these areas up. But it does not it can't hide the fact um, that if you go further out, the amount of rubbish that's lying in fields at the side of the road um, is quite exceptional. And if you then look at the uh, dumping, um, yeah, again, we'll be doing what we can, but it's the only crime that I know where the victim has to pay. Um, and I think that is wrong. Uh, if someone's dumping stuff in your land, you should not be responsible for it. Uh, 
And I would just ask if is there any other action we can take to identify who is doing this, um, particularly in the rural area? Because um, it, it, it demeans everything, the amount that's there. Thanks, Alec. Um, yeah, I mean, I think every one of us will agree with you on that, and it is very unjust that someone who's a victim of a crime has to fought the bill to, um, to, to sort the matter out. Uh, the question becomes, though, who should? Um, but, you know, and the local authorities obviously can't afford to do it. Um, so, you know, that's a, a huge problem for everyone. I think every action that can possibly be taken has been taken. Uh, and we all know that a lot of these cases are people driving in from outside an authority to dump in a rural area um, huge amounts of waste materials. Um, I think I understand there's legislative change that will allow greater use of things like fixed penalty notices and uh, place a, a responsibility on householders themselves to actually, um, you know, to have a duty of care in regards to what they do with their um, household waste. So anything that's identified as being dumped uh, in rural areas can perhaps be traced back. Um, but it's not an easy, um, it's not an easy nut to crack. I don't think, because um, I'm sure everybody appreciates. I've got um, Kevin Carr would like to come in on this one. Chair, you maybe answered it better than I was going to answer because you covered all the main points. Um, but just to reassure um, Councillor Allison, we did, we did a lot of publicity over the summer about roadside litter. Um, we're working closely with comms and PR, as the report states, to develop one of the Council's 10 key uh, PR camp campaigns for this year. And what we're really looking to do is make sure that that doesn't become a campaign. It's something that's sustainable, that we become known for, that we're trying to change behaviours. Um, we're trying to promote a local environment um, and promote, as I said, the change of behaviours in local residents that, uh, in terms of litter and in-fly tipping. Um, and one of the themes even within that campaign will be about roadside littering because we recognise it's one of our biggest challenges. Um, in terms of the enforcement side, I think you're right. Again, it's one of our biggest challenges. We get regular <coughs> inquiries around fly tipping on private land um, of a significant scale that would be a cost to the council to move if we were to do it. Um, and again, the circular economy bill, um, as I mentioned er earlier, is proposing much stronger, uh, greater enforcement powers for local authorities to be able to enforce um, much greater ownership and responsibility around um, your own waste uh, and obligations around that. Thank you very much for that, Kevin. Um, can, um, Alec, would you like to come back in? I know it's your style for this. Sorry, I, hadn't, I wasn't really going to, but just to say, I actually don't dis disagree with what you're saying. I don't have a solution. It's simply needing to highlight how we take that forward, um, because what's happening at the moment simply isn't working. So it's not that I disagree with yourself or Kevin. Cheers. Yeah. Thank, thanks very much for Alec, that, Alec. I think you'll find there's huge agreement with you, to be honest. Um, Councillor Barker. Thank you for that report. Um, I really supported the previous councillors and um, Kevin Carr's uh, answers, which partly answers uh, my question. Um, th there's no doubt that the support given to um, volunteer litter pickers is one of the highlights of you know, one of our successes um, doing that. At the same time, I, I do have the slight concern about volunteers litter picking along the verges of uh, roads with de you know, de-restricted speeds. Um, I haven't heard of any real issues, but you know, there's that concern there, as we have for our own staff. One of the things, outside the urban areas, it is roadside litter. And unfortunately, we can do a litter pick, whoever does it, and within days and certainly within weeks, it's back to where it was before. And this is litter thrown out you know, almost entirely by um, motorised vehicles, drivers, cars, trucks. And there's no deterrent. Uh, and although we don't really want to see the surveillance society, that just seemed to be the only way that we can impress on people they must not throw stuff out of vehicles. Um, probably beyond the council, but something we need to think about. Thanks very much. Thanks very much for that, Ralph. Um, Councillor Ross. Yes, thanks very much, Chair. Um, it was really just uh, a comment more than anything else. Uh, I do agree with uh, Councillor Mars and the idea that uh, maybe more signage 
uh, would help with the problem. But uh, I do notice when I'm out and about, uh, not so much in town centres, uh, but areas where uh, people walk their dogs uh, down by the side of the river, the lower hall in Hamilton, for instance, uh, there seems to be a definite lack of receptacles to put dog litter in, uh, which results in, uh, in the summer, people hanging their dog poo in branches, which is OK until the winter, and then the leaves go, and you have these dog poo bags hanging everywhere, which is absolutely disgusting. Uh, so, you know, my plea is that we, we do look at this situation and that we do provide uh, more signage and more receptacles uh, for these rubbish in areas, not so much in the town centre, but recognised dog walking areas. Thanks, Chair. <coughs> Thanks very much for that. I'm um, going to go to Kevin Carr. Okay. Thanks for the question, uh, Councillor Ross. I share your sentiment um, with that. We, we regularly get requests for bins in, in new places and additional places where, where there's increased footfall or new footfall, um, and we're happy to do that when there's a case for it. Um, the bigger ish, issue for me is, you know, we can have all the infrastructure in the world, but what we're talking about here is we've got cultural problems, I think, in this country around littering and fly tipping, and even the, the Keep Scotland Beautiful National Litter Strategy which has just been recently published again, probably still isn't hard-hitting enough around all of that because what we're doing is cleaning up after people's irresponsibility. Um, again, if you've got any specific examples or locations, we're more than happy to look at that, whether it's signage or bin infrastructure. Um, but I'll just refer you back to my previous answer about the work we're doing with PR and comms. I would just really like to be much harder-hitting around the messages around this as a council. We need to do it as a country, but as a council as well, I think we've got a way to go in terms of the messaging around that, both the carrot and the stick. Yeah, thank you very much. Would you like to come back in, John? No, no, I'm fine with that. Maybe some pictures of things hanging from trees yeah. put out by our comms uh, might uh, bring bring the problem to the fore and maybe more people would take it, uh, acknowledge the situation. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you for that. I'll certainly take that up with the uh, communications team, actually. I think it's a good idea. I've, I've absolutely no objection to particularly social media being used in a manner that might uh, shock people into taking responsible courses of action. So, thank you very much. Um, can I ask uh, the committee to agree to note the report? Thank you very much. I have no items of urgent business. None have been intimated to me. So, with that, I will thank everyone for their attendance and participation and bring the meeting to a close. Thank you all. Cheers.